This is a Religica production. R-E-L-I-G-I-C-A. So I'm here with Karenna Gore. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. In this conversation. And among a number of things that you've done, you're also currently the director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. That's right. And an earlier director of community affairs for the Association to Benefit Children. Is that right? Correct. But before we get into all that, you're also the author of Lighting the Way, Nine Women Who Changed Modern America. Yes. Well, I'd love to ask you first a couple questions about that book. Wonderful. Thank you. These nine women, as I understand, tackled inequality. They fought for change from, from Ida Wells Barnett, a former slave, mm-hmm. to Mother Jones, Alice Hamilton, and more. For our listener, what were the features of strength that these women had in common? Or are there features that we can all exhibit in our communities today that's resonant with who these women were? Well, thank you so much. I, I wrote Lighting the Way to lift up the voices and stories of women who made a major difference in the United States uh, in terms of of our our policies. So ending child labor, putting protections against the dumping of industrial poisons, calling attention to the horror of lynching and and fighting for for the right to vote and for racial equality. These are are, um, movements that were successful in the U.S. and yet often we don't really understand why. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you sometimes have a sort of flat story um, that is told historically that there was one woman, I mean, an example from the civil rights movement would be that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus and, and that was that. But then when you look at the backstory, you find that she had been very active in the local NAACP and she had gone to a, a training mm-hmm. in a citizenship school led by Septima Clark, who is one of the women that I wrote about. Wow. And Septima Clark was an African-American woman from the Deep South who was a teacher and who really, from her own conviction, and it certainly was uh, on a moral and spiritual level, aligning herself and offering her life and service to what she knew was right, despite the fact that she didn't have what you would see as conventional power or authority in the society at the time. She really drew from that strong spiritual source and from the teachings of her elders. And she made a huge difference in the civil rights movement through impacting other people. John Lewis, who was famous in his role in Selma and uh, the Freedom Rides and and went on to be a U.S. congressman, great civil rights leader, also encountered Septima Clark. So I'm very interested in, in the kinds of these stories of those women who who really led from a place that was maybe a bit more outsider-ish in terms of of how we think about power. And yet they made a difference. And and in fact, their status, if you want to call it that, actually turned out to be the very source of their power, that they were not looking to get the credit themselves and to please those at the top of 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 the pyramid or whatever. They were just looking to change and to be and teach and act in a way that would make this country better. So I was I was really happy to be able to to immerse in those stories and to write that book. And thank you for asking. Oh no, my pleasure. And I, you know, as I listen to you, I think of the the spiritual and moral center as you're describing it that these women drew from, but others, John Lewis and others. And then we all draw our values from a kind of moral center. And then I transition, I think of your Center for Earth Ethics and the work that it plans for the near future. And I imagine what you just said is also a part of your leadership there in terms of how we're focused on the center of values that should be clear and how we treat one another, how we treat the environment. What's the work of the center and and how do you describe that to others? Well, the Center for Earth Ethics draws from the world's faith and wisdom and indigenous traditions in order to meet the challenge of the ecological crisis that includes climate change. It also just includes the fact that we're, we have these planetary boundaries. Deforestation is another face of it, the depletion of, of water aquifers and all of the the increasing use of fossil fuels that's leading to the pollution in the air that causes climate change. So we feel that this problem 
is not just about science. It's, it's, not, it's not easily explained or solved by just uh, the scientific consensus, even though there is one. And it's not even really only about economics, because there are also arguments that there can be plenty of new jobs and plenty of, of, of healthy economic um, flourishing from renewable energy. But the problem is spiritual and moral, and it's about what do we value. Maybe along the same line of thinking, I'd like to switch gears a little and, and speak about something I heard an indigenous chief from Greenland say recently. Uncle. Uncle. Uh -huh. Uncle. He's just a remarkable. He is wonderful. Human he was being. at he was at the Religions for the Earth conference. Oh, was he? And he is indeed a, a prophetic voice. He is prophetic in the sense that that should transform hearts. And he mentions that the only ice that needs to melt today is in fact the ice in the human heart. And that's a really provocative thing to say. When you think of what needs to be transformed inside of us to make that next step in our discussion around climate change, what needs to change in the human heart? Well, I, I think of the words of Thomas Berry, who wrote that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. And that, for me, really summarizes the change that needs to happen. I think many of us, and actually I don't think this is true innately, I don't think children are, nest, are, are like that, but we're conditioned, and this very much depends on your social location obviously, but conditioned to view people who are not like us and the whole rest of the natural world as objects for our own use. Certainly in our present society there's so much of production and consumption and consumerism that is driving how people live their lives uh, daily. Of course, that also depends on your social location, but I'm speaking about the general thrust. And um, so I think that shifting to see that there is intrinsic value and being in trees, in animals, in uh, bodies of water, that these are uh, alive and they have their own subjecthood and their own, in, in my understanding spiritually, relationship to creator and to the world that we live in, which is interconnected. So the change that I think is needed is to see that we have that connection that the world, this, this beautiful planet, is full of life forms on which we depend. We have our, we breathe, we eat, we drink water, and yet our cultures have really been designed in such a way to kind of condition us to think that hum human beings are separate and superior to all of that, and it's all for our use. So, and there are obviously some theological roots to that, which is one reason why it's really a very rich experience to to study and, and do this work at a seminary. Mm -hmm. well, we're a bit on the clock now, aren't we? Yes. I mean, we've been just told recently by the United Nations that we have about 12 years before we start to see irreparable harm to a degree that would really be tragic for not just humanity, but for every other species on the planet, which brings up another point. You know, we've discovered that we have I think it's, it's the mid 80s, 60% reduction in animal life on the planet. I think that's yes. right that we're just learning. Yes. How do you think people should take in that kind of quantitative data that allows for a qualitative change in how they treat? Well, it's, it's very interesting, that question. And one of the things that comes up in our, in our annual minister's training at Center for Earth Ethics is how to process grief and the role that people of faith have, not only the prophetic role of calling out things as they are and making those uncomfortable truths known, but also the pastoral role of how do we guide people towards, through a, a, a period of grief and understanding what it is we are losing here. And I think that is a huge barrier to action on this because people can't it's difficult to bear the, the 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 grief and the the sadness the sense that it's what what we are all many of us feel complicit in these systems because we are consumers and we're just so intertwined and very very few people can in the world today can say that they're not enmeshed in these systems that are destructive i was thinking i hesitated earlier because i think one of the things that we do rather than consider the care for our families, the well-being of our, um, of our neighborhoods, 
is to consider an extraction model or a way of building almost a kind of internal manifest destiny philosophy that if I could just build my way out of this, we'll all be fine. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of deniability in that. But I think you're suggesting to turn back uh, and look also at those core values that should shape all of us and not give ourselves so fully to, to denying what place they should have. When you look across religions or moral voices in particular who impress you, what are the authors that you think a listener should say, you know, I need to go pick up that book tomorrow? Wow. It's a, it's a very good question. I, I find that Buddhism has a lot to offer right now. Thich Nhat Hanh has, has written um, books uh, that deal with some of the, the issues of oneness in terms of our own internal lives and the, the health of our communities and, and our, our world. The concept of karma, I think, is quite useful in understanding what's happening in terms of, of cause and effect with how our economies run and function, what they don't count, what, they, what are considered externalities, but actually, of course, in a karmic way, because the universe doesn't ignore them, will come back. So I would lift him up from that tradition. Reverend William Barber is a wonderful thinker and activist who is now, along with my friend, uh, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, leading the Poor People's Campaign, a, a revival of the effort that Martin Luther King was leading at the end of his life. And William Barber has done so much to provide moral framework around some of these issues. I also admire Pope Francis and Patriarch Bartholomew. I think they're doing uh, really great work. Um, I, my friend Marianne Williamson, who uh, has has written many um, best selling books and, and recently wrote Healing the Soul of America, has also written about this from the standpoint of we need a culture that cares first for our children. Um, and that is the sign of a healthy culture where we put that first. And we understand that lots of people who are vulnerable and desperate and in need is always a national security threat, is always a threat to, to, to the whole. So we need to shift our values in that way. So there, there are others. As I said, Catherine Hayhoe does, does wonderful work bringing science and religion together in terms of the kinds of observations and then actions and thoughts that come from those observations that we need to be taking with us out into the world. When I listen to some pundits say that climate change isn't happening, and if the listener considers himself an ocean, it's just one more gulp of carbon that you just can't take. It's too much. It's too much. I mean, how do we feed this line to our children that climate change isn't happening or climate chaos isn't happening? And so we should just keep subsidizing coal and burning fossil fuels and diminishing native species in the world. How do you understand or help the listener understand how that logic is still out there and gaining ground. Well, I think that, as I said before, we have people living in different information yeah. ecosystems. And so we have to understand that with some measure of empathy. But I also think we live in, in the middle of a, of a terrible addiction. I think we're, our society and culture is addicted to fossil fuels and that that voice is the voice of an addict who wants to continue because even if they're vaguely aware and more and more aware that there are costs, it hasn't yet reached a level. I mean, really where we are is how much more damage are we going to do? Because we will change. The world in the Paris Agreement came together and stated a common goal. That was an extraordinary moment. And yes, there are problems and inadequacies with the Paris Agreement, sure. but it was an extraordinary moment. We know that we will stop the digging and burning of this material within the body of the earth. We're going to stop doing that and putting it into the atmosphere we because have we have to. It won't, we, we, cannot, we cannot survive. The question is, like for any addict, how much more damage will you do before you make that change? And I think that what we have learned from people who have written about this, and there's a great deal of wonderful literature that, that intersects spirituality and addiction and explains that no amount of, of rational evidence uh, from your doctor is going to do the same job as when you appeal to a higher power. I think that we are in that situation as a collective mind now. And I don't mean a higher power has to be uh, God as, as some people understand it. It could be that feeling of concern and love for your children. 
And that's where I think maybe, you know, we see some hope with this case, the Our Children's Trust case, the Juliana case, which I'm amazed and delighted the Supreme Court did not stop, that we're now going to have an actual trial where people are going to need to look at evidence and hear the voices of these young people who are speaking clearly from a place where we can't turn and look away. So that may be a really good turning point for this country if the media pays attention to it. So what's your sense that they will? I think that some probably it will have to be forced on some other outlets. I mean, I try to one of the ways that I think is important to put more information out about climate change to increase awareness and consciousness is to support those journalists inside climate news and Grist and Eco Watch and those um, Desmog blog. Those are some examples of people that are do doing everyday, really deep work on climate change. And so they they are there to remind those conventional mainstream media outlets. There's also a project called End Climate Silence. So to in order to to heal that information ecosystem, so that we can be in one conversation, or rather, we don't have to have what was called alternate facts. We can at least agree on a set of, of facts, but then you're welcome to have your own opinion. And let's, let's do this in a way that, as we have learned over time as a human species, is the best way, which is to bring reason and to bring values, and then vision will evolve for the good of the whole. This podcast was made possible by Religica Allies.